Welcome to the Post Manifesto Polygamy 1890 to 1904 video. Pictured above, we have some LDS uh, gentlemen that went to prison uh, because they didn't want to give up polygamy. Uh, pictured in the middle here, we have George Q. Cannon, who was an apostle, and in the first presidency around this time, 1890, uh, when the manifesto went into place, he was not willing to give up polygamy, I guess, so he did some time. All right, so what is the main source for this video? Uh, well, here it is on the slide. Uh, BYU professor D. Michael Quinn, Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought. The article is called LDS Church Authority and New Plural Marriages, 1890 to 1904. Uh, 1985 uh, edition of Dialogue. Uh, you can see the cover of this dialogue. You can see... Uh, the title here on the articles and essays page. Uh, this is a very good article. Uh, I recommend reading the whole thing to get uh, more context. It is about 100 pages long. So it is long, it is in depth, uh, but it's very well done. D. Michael Quinn was a member of the church at this time, teaching at BYU. He had uh, all kinds of access to uh, Mormon church historical records. There are sources in here that I've never seen anywhere else. There's journals. Uh, there's like first presidency uh, ledgers and notes and things. That seems like Quinn had very good access uh, uh, for this paper to the church archives. All right. A little statement here from the manifesto, which was uh, put out by the prophet Wilford Woodruff on September 24th, 1890. Uh, this manifesto can be found in any LDS edition of the Doctrine and Covenants published since 1908. It was published as Official Declaration and in the 1981 edition as Official Declaration 1 because uh, there was another declaration. So this manifesto is in the scriptures. Uh, I guess you could say it's canonized. So the prophet Wilford Woodruff said in this manifesto, I deny that either 40 or any other number of plural marriages have during that period since June of 1889 been solemnized in our temples or in any other place in the territory. He denies it, that there's 40 or any other number. None solemnized in the temple, none in the territory. Well, I don't think that's true. <laughs> and he's not talking about Canada and Mexico, which we'll get to. Okay, another statement here from the manifesto, September 24th, 1890, uh, supposedly by Prophet Wilford Woodruff. And I now publicly declare that my advice to the, to the Latter-day Saints is to refrain from contracting any marriage forbidden by the law of the land. Refrain from it. It's not what the church did, however. Uh, apparently, the manifesto was put out as a pamphlet, Manifesto of the Presidency and Apostles, Issued December uh, 18, 1889, I think that says. Uh, also, the official declaration or manifesto by the President Wilford Woodruff prohibiting further plural marriages and its adoption by the General Conference on October 6, 1890. This was put out uh, by the Deseret News. Okay, so about a week later, September 30, 1890, there was an editorial in the Deseret Evening News uh, which uh, said, anybody who calls the language of President Woodruff's declaration uh, indefinite must be either exceedingly dense or determined to find fault. It is so definite that its meaning cannot be mistaken by anyone who understands simple English. So, of course, this is a church paper. Uh, they published this editorial. This was supposed to be definite, right? They had to, to stop all... Uh, polygamy, all plural marriages, not what they did, however. Uh, synonyms for dense, I guess. <laughs> this guy's pretty harsh here. Uh, thick, obtuse, compact, dumb, stupid. Okay, so about three or four days later, October 3rd, 1890, there was another editorial in the Deseret Evening News. Uh, nothing could be more direct and unambiguous than the language of President Woodruff nor could anything be more authoritative. So this is kind of what they would uh, say to the public. All right, uh, another statement from BYU professor of American history. 
D. Michael Quinn and his article that we talked about that came out in the spring of 1985. So Quinn says, a few days after this last editorial, the church authorities presented this unambiguous document for a sustaining vote of the general conference. And what was the result? All right, so if you don't know the story of D. Michael Quinn, uh, he was eventually uh, excommunicated and lost his position at BYU. Uh, looks like about three years later, after he put out that post-manifesto post -manifesto, uh, article, I think that article got him into a little bit of trouble, along with some other stuff he was doing. Uh, so D. Michael Quinn taught at BYU until he resigned in January of 1988 due to the ongoing pressure from some authorities who wanted to see him leave. <clears throat> Source for this, uh, George D. Smith, uh, Gary J. Bergera, Religion, Feminism, and Freedom of Conscience, 1994. All right, so it was about five years after he uh, resigned from BYU that uh, Quinn was excommunicated as part of the September 6th. On September 26, 1993, Quinn was excommunicated from the LDS Church as one of the September 6. You can see this in Wikipedia. There's also a new book that just came out called The September 6 and the Struggle for the Soul of Mormonism by Sarah M. Patterson. I think this is going to be a very good book. Uh, and I watched the Mormon Stories uh, interview of Sarah. She, she seems to be very knowledgeable about this. And very unfortunate that Quinn uh, was excommunicated and lost his job at BYU because, in my opinion, he's one of the best, if not the best, Mormon historians uh, ever. <laughs> okay, another uh, statement by Quinn. Uh, he says, during the next 13 and a half years, members of the First Presidency individually or as a unit published 24 denials that any new plural marriages were being performed. And many of these people knew that that was a lie. They, they knew of uh, quite a few different plural marriages that had been performed, uh, which we're going to get to all that information. All right. Uh, an, an article uh, in the Salt Lake Times, don't hear about this paper too much, uh, did an interview of the Prophet Wilford Woodruff and President George Q. Cannon on Mormon political policy, June 23, 1891. Uh, question, uh, I guess the, they're interviewing uh, Wilford Woodruff uh, and Cannon. Uh, is it your understanding that if a member of the Mormon church sends the issuance of the manifesto and its adoption by the church should enter into polygamy, he would thereby violate the creed of the church and would it be wrong for him to do so? Answer, a member of the church who should now enter into that relation would violate the rule of the church and he would be considered a wrongdoer. Okay, the interview continues with Woodford and Cannon. June 23, 1891, Cannon pictured above. Uh, question, would you or any officer of the church authorize a polygamous marriage or countenance the practice of unlawful cohabitation? Uh, answer, again, we have to say that we can only speak for ourselves and say that we would not authorize any such marriage or any practice violative of the law. Well, they were authorizing marriages, especially canon. All right, same interview. Uh, Woodford is pictured above uh, in the Salt Lake Times. Uh, question, is it your understanding that the Mormon people are in good faith observing the laws of the United States prohibiting polygamy and unlawful cohabitation? Answer, that is our understanding. All right, let's go to another statement uh, by the Prophet Wilford Woodruff, President George Q. Cannon, and Joseph F. Smith, uh, which formed uh, the First Presidency at this time, uh, and they are pictured above. Uh, this is the Refutation of Utah Commission Report on Plural Marriages, October 6, 1891, in the Desert News Weekly. Uh, during the past year, uh, notwithstanding the manifesto, reports by the Commission, this is the Utah Commission Report on Plural Marriages, uh, report, uh, reports by the Commission of 18 male persons who, with an equal number of females, are believed to have entered <clears throat> are believed to have entered into polygamous marriages during the year 18, 
couples. We have to say that it is utterly without foundation in truth, according to the First Presidency, right? All right, same source here. Uh, by the First Presidency of the Church in 1891, uh, we repeat in the most solemn manner the declaration made by President Wilford Woodruff at our general conference held last October that there have been no plural marriages solemnized, solemnized, none during the period named. But is that true? Okay, the first presidency continues. Uh, polygamy or plural marriage has not been taught. I think it was. <laughs> Neither has there been given permission to any person, to anybody, to enter into this practice. But on the contrary, it has been strictly forbidden. Okay, let's go to another source, the Reed Smoot hearings of 1904 to 1906, when they were interviewing uh, Prophet Joseph F. Smith. What did he say about uh, discontinuing polygamy and the manifesto? So there's a Senator uh, Hoare, I guess that's how you say that, Senator Hoare, uh, who says, so that I understand, so that I understand, if I get it right, that your attitude is that while it was originally a divine command to practice polygamy, and so, of course, it must be a thing innocent and lawful and proper in itself, in the nature of things, yet that the obligation to do it as a divine ordinance is now discontinued, and therefore there being no divine command to do it, your people submit themselves to the civil law in that particular. Is that your idea, Mr. Prophet Joseph F. Smith? And Joseph F. Smith says, yes, uh, that is correct, Senator. Uh, so, yeah, he's lying. <laughs> All right, Reed Smoot hearings again, 1904 to 1906. Uh, another response uh, in this interview kind of being grilled by the senator, uh, the Mr. Prophet Joseph F. Smith gives another response. He's pictured above. It was understood that plural marriages had ceased. It has been the continuous and conscientious practice and rule of the church ever since the manifesto to observe that manifesto with regard to plural marriages. And from that time until today, there has never been, never been, to my knowledge, a plural marriage performed in accordance with the understanding, instruction, connivance, counsel, or permission of those presiding authorities of the church or of the church in any shape or form. And I know whereof I speak, gentlemen, in relation to that matter. This is also a lie. Joseph F. Smith himself. Uh, gave approval for some of these marriages. Okay, same hearings here, the Reed Smoot hearings. Uh, the chairman says, now one other question. You have said that you know of no instance of plural marriage since 1890. Prophet Joseph F. Smith says, yes. The chairman says, performed in the state of Utah. And Mr. Worthington says, by the church, of course. And Mr. Smith says, yes. No plural marriages since 1890. None performed in the state of Utah. Mr. Smith says, yes, that is correct. Well, he's lying. All right, same hearings here. Uh, Senator Foraker uh, says, or with their approval, the chairman says, I so understand you. And, and the prophet Joseph F. Smith says, yes, sir. The chairman says, will you state whether you have performed any plural marriages outside the state of Utah? Mr. Smith says, no, sir, I never have. Well, he doesn't have to do it himself, right? He can give authorization to others that are uh, down in Mexico. Okay, another statement from the hearings. Uh, the chairman says, either in Mexico, and the prophet Joseph F. Smith says, nowhere on earth, sir. They're not pre performing plural marriages anywhere, right? The chairman says, do you know of any such, Mr. Smith? And he says, no, sir, I do not. The chairman says, that is all. Mr. Smith says, I wish to say again, Mr. Chairman, this is Joseph F. Smith, 
that there have been no plural marriages solemnized by and with the consent or by the knowledge of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints by any man, I do not care who he is. There have been none, he says. Uh, of course, this is a lie. All right, uh, Senator Du Bois asks a question now. I guess he's pictured above. If an apostle of the church had performed such a polygamous ceremony within or without the jurisdiction of the United States, would you consider that being with the authority of your church? Uh, if an apostle did it. Okay, these hearings continue here. Another statement uh, by the prophet Joseph F. Smith. He says, if any apostle or any other man claiming authority should do any such thing as that, he would not only be subject to prosecution and a heavy fine and imprisonment in the state under the state law, but he would also be subjected to discipline and excommunication from the church uh, by the proper tribunals of the church. Well, 1890 to 1904, this is not true. And Joseph F. Smith was even giving approval to some of the apostles uh, down in Mexico to do uh, plural marriages. Uh, there was a Good Mormon Stories with John Larson recently on the Reed Smoot hearings. That, uh, I'd recommend going and watching that. All right, Senator Foraker now asks a question. I guess he's pictured above. Uh, as for the excommunication from the church, that would be imposed upon him no matter whether it were performed inside the United States or outside. Prophet Joseph F. Smith says, I do not know any different. It is contrary to the rules of the church, whether they did it in uh, Mexico or the, the U.S. And then Senator uh, Foraker says, uh, that was the question that I asked you, whether or not if performed without the United States, these penalties would be imposed. All right, and the Prophet Joseph F. Smith answers the question. He says, uh, well, it would be all the same. If any complaint was made of any such thing as that and proof had, the man doing it would not only be subject to prosecution under the law, but he would be subject to discipline in the church. All right, these hearings continue here. Uh, Senator Foraker uh, says, the point that I wish to call your attention to is that if performed, uh, and he's talking about polygamous marriages, if performed without the United States, he could not be prosecuted for it in Utah. And uh, Prophet Joseph F. Smith says, uh, oh no. And Senator Foraker says, it would not be an offense against the laws of Utah. Mr. Smith says, to be sure. Senator Foraker says, but would the church nevertheless impose its penalty of excommunication? Say, you know, that somebody authorized uh, plural marriage in Mexico. Mr. Smith says, it would, Mr. Senator, if any complaint of that kind was made and proven. They're supposed to be excommunicating, you know, people performing and authorizing uh, plural marriages in Mexico. All right, a statement from Quinn here in the, in the article. Uh, the climax of that series of little manifestos was the second manifesto on plural marriage sustained by a vote of a general conference. So <clears throat> first manifesto wasn't enough. <laughs> they had the second one, which we'll get to what that said. Uh, we have a flyer above $800 reward for John Taylor and George Q. Cannon to be paid for the arrest of John Taylor and George Q. Cannon. The above reward will be paid for the delivery to me or uh, for information that will lead to the arrest of John Taylor, the president of the Mormon Church, and George Q. Cannon, his counselor in the First Presidency. Or the $500 will be paid for Cannon alone and $300 for Taylor. Seems like they wanted Cannon more than they wanted the Prophet John Taylor for some reason. <laughs> uh, signed by S.H. Uh, Gilson. All right, so the Prophet Joseph F. Smith gives another lie here in, in an article called The Second Manifesto in the Desert Evening News, April 6, 1904. Uh, Inasmuch as there are numerous reports in circulation that plural marriages have been entered into contrary to the official declaration of President Woodruff of September 24, 1890, 
commonly called the Manifesto, I, Joseph F. Smith, President of the Church, hereby affirm and declare that no such marriages have been solemnized, solemnized with the sanction, consent, or knowledge of the Church. Uh, straight up lie. Okay, interesting little tidbit here for the Salt Lake Herald, October 9th, 1890. Uh, the Apostle Heber J. Grant was the publisher of the Salt Lake Herald. Uh, after the manifesto's acceptance by the October General Conference, uh, the Salt Lake Herald editorialized that the anti-Mormon Salt Lake Tribune pretends the declaration is a revelation. But they want to say uh, this manifesto was not a revelation. Uh, although no one today has heard anyone except the lying sheet, that damn anti-Mormon uh, Salt Lake Tribune, uh, they were the ones lying, saying that the manifesto was a revelation. Okay, a little tidbit of information in the Reed Smoot hearings, volume 4, page 481. Uh, the majority report of a U.S. Senate committee declared in a bold uh, heading in 1906 that the manifesto is a deception. What well, was it? Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right, a little bit of a statement here from Klaus J. Hansen, a professor of history at Queen's University, put out a book uh, called Quest for Empire in 1967. Uh, he said the prophet Wilford Woodruff may have considered the manifesto merely a tactical maneuver in order to protect the kingdom of God, to protect the kingdom of God as well as the church. All right, some uh, Mormon church historians want to deny that claim uh, by Hansen. Uh, these are the assistant church historian James B. Allen and BYU professor Glenn M. Leonard, the story of the Latter-day Saints, 1976. They said the manifesto was not simply a political document, all right, statement from the Apostle Joseph Fielding Smith in Essentials in Church History, 1922. Uh, so we're going to get to, you know, some statements in other church books. Some of, some of these are cover-up statements. Uh, Joseph Fielding Smith, he says, President Woodruff's manifesto, while the saints were in the midst of all these difficulties and afflictions, President Wilford Woodruff sought the Lord for relief. In answer to his earnest pleadings and constant petitions, the word of the Lord came to him in a revelation, so he disagrees with Heber J. Grant, I guess, and the Salt Lake Herald, came to him in a revelation suspending the practice of plural marriage. Well, if it was a revelation, uh, they went against the revelation because they continued to, to uh, perform a lot of plural marriages. All right, the Apostle John A. Widso agrees with Joseph Fielding Smith in the Improvement Era, November 1940. He says, there, uh, there is direct evidence that the manifesto was the product of revelation. All right, Bruce R. McConkie in Mormon Doctrine, 1958, also says it's a revelation. The manifesto is published in the Doctrine and Covenants. It is a revelation in the sense that the Lord both commanded President Woodruff to write it and told him what to write. Well, it's my understanding that Woodruff did like a rough draft and he had other, other people help him write it. Okay, Bruce R. McConkie continues. Uh, it, the manifesto, is not, however, the same type of revelation found in most of the sections of the Doctrine and Covenants in that the language, though inspired, is not that uh, is not that of the Lord speaking in the first person. Okay, a statement from the prophet Spencer W. Kimball in a general conference talk entitled "God Will Not Be Mocked," October 1974. Uh, we warn you against the so-called polygamy cults which would lead you astray. So now, those people uh, practicing polygamy, they're now in a cult. Uh, remember the Lord brought an end to this program many decades ago through a prophet who proclaimed the revelation to the world. So he says it's a revelation 
brought to an end, you know, from the first manifesto. No, not exactly. Okay, church historian Leonard J. Arrington and assistant church historian Davis Byton in the Mormon Experience 1979 also say that the manifesto was a divine revelation. The manifesto was presented to the church members by President Woodruff as a divine revelation, countermanding the revealed instructions that had inaugurated polygamy 50 years before. One revelation counseling out another uh, revelation, I guess. Okay, so who really wrote the manifesto? We get some information in the Reed Smoot hearings, volume 2, 51 and 52 uh, pages. When asked about the manifesto on the witness stand and who wrote it, a secretary in the first presidency's office, George Reynolds, testified in 1904 that I assisted to write it in collaboration with Apostle Charles W. Penrose and John R. Winder, who transcribed the notes and changed the language slightly to adapt it for publication. So pictured above, George Reynolds on the left with the big long beard, pictures on the right, Apostle Charles W. Penrose. So those three, and I guess, you know, uh, Wilford Woodruff did like a rough draft. Okay, a statement from the Mormon fundamentalist Lauren C. Woolley in Musser's book, Book of Remembrance, August 7, 1922. Uh, Lauren C. Woolley told Mormon fundamentalists that Wilford Woodruff was not the author of the manifesto, uh, but that it was actually written by Charles W. Penrose, Frank J. Cannon, pictured above, and John H. White, the butcher revised by non-Mormon federal officials, and that Woodruff merely signed it. So, not sure how much of that is true. All right, a statement from the First Presidency in 1907. This can be found in Messages of the First Presidency, Volume 4. In 1907, the First Presidency announced, when all the circumstances are weighed, the wonder is not that there have been sporadic cases of plural marriage, but that such cases have been so few. Well, they may not be as few as you think. All right, a little bit of honesty from church historian and apostle Joseph Fielding Smith, Essentials in Church History, 1922. Uh, Smith says that some plural marriages had been entered into contrary to the announcement of President Woodruff and also a statement made by President Lorenzo Snow so that he said there were some Plural marriages after the manifesto. All right, a little bit of honesty from church historian B.H. Roberts, Comprehensive History of the Church, Volume 6, 1930, Roberts pictured above. Uh, the injunction of the said manifesto had not been strictly adhered to, even by some high officials of the church, and people uh, misled by them. The manifesto not strictly adhered to. Okay, in 1907, statement by the First Presidency, uh, there were a few overzealous individuals who refused to submit even to the action of the church in such a matter as polygamy, or that these few should find others who sympathize with their views. Mormon fundamentalists, maybe. Uh, the number, however, is small. Well, like I said, I don't think it's as small as you think. Okay, a 1933 statement by the First Presidency. A few misguided members of the church secretly associated themselves together for the avowed purpose of perpetuating the practice of polygamy or plural marriage in defiance of the pledge made to the government. And, you know, they weren't authorized by apostles of the church, right? Or presidents of the church, no way. All right, a statement here from Quinn. Uh, some high officials of the church still practice polygamy, according to B.H. Roberts' centennial history, which later identified them as Apostles John W. Taylor and Matthias F. Cowley, note that they are apostles, who were dropped from the Quorum of the Twelve in 1906 because they were out of harmony with the First Presidency concerning the Manifesto. Now, there were people in the first presidency kind of funneling people to, to these <laughs> uh, to these two apostles to, to uh, perform uh, plural marriages. 
Uh, so yeah, source for this, Church Historian B.H. Roberts, Comprehensive History of the Church, Volume 6, 1930. Quinn calls that a centennial history. Pictured above, John W. Taylor and Matthias F. Cowley. All right, Assistant Church Historian James B. Allen and BYU Professor Glenn M. Leonard uh, basically admit to this in the Story of the Latter-day Saints book, 1976. Pictured above is Allen. Uh, it was true that a few church authorities had adopted a literal interpretation of the manifesto. Well, it's more than a few. In spite of President Woodruff's statement that it applied everywhere and had continued to perform plural marriages outside of Utah. All right, uh, Allen and Leonard continue in the story of the Latter-day Saints. Uh, Leonard pictured above. Uh, this was without official sanction from the first presidency. Mm, no, no. Not in every case. But the new declaration was a definite indication that the practice must stop. All right. Secretary of the First Presidency, Francis M. Gibbons, wrote a book about Joseph F. Smith, Patriarch and Preacher, Prophet of God, 1981. He's written a lot of books. Most of them are very uh, faith-promoting. But here he uh, gives a little bit of honest information. Uh, the voluminous testimony in the Smoot hearings showed that a comparatively large number of polygamous marriages had been performed after the manifesto by some who held the sealing power. Who were these some? Who was approving of these things? Well, yeah, First Presidency and Apostles. Uh, Gibbons pictured above. All right, back to Joseph Fielding Smith, Essentials in Church History. Uh, John W. Taylor, who is the son of President John Taylor and Matthias F. Cowley, resigned from the Quorum of the Twelve. Well, I'm not sure if they resigned. Uh, because they maintain that the manifesto applied to the United States only. It wasn't just them. Uh, however, however, the attitude of the church was that it applied to the entire world. No, no not really. Uh, pictured above, John W. Taylor. All right, back to church historian B.H. Roberts, Comprehensive History of the Church, Volume 6, 1930. Uh, Robert says, by 1891, the prohibition of polygamy was to be universal. Not really. As well in foreign countries as in the United States. Uh, no. This, uh, the decrees against its practice were effective in all the countries of the world. Uh, no. And here is just a straight up direct lie by the prophet uh, George Albert Smith, General Conference, October 1947. Smith pictured above. Uh, since September 1890, there have been no plural marriages solemnized in violation of the laws of this land by the church. Since 1890, none. No plural marriages. <laughs> Not true. Okay, a book by Carter Eldridge Grant, The Kingdom of God Restored, Deseret Book, 1955. This book was endorsed by the Apostle Adam S. Binion. Uh, for several years after the manifesto was issued, however, members of the church in Mexico and Canada were allowed to practice plural marriage, but later it was discontinued throughout the church. Okay, a statement from the Scriptures of the Church for the Sunday Schools, 1968. Uh, a few were married after 1890 in Mexico and Canada and on the high seas, a few, outside the jurisdiction of the United States. Well, there was a few in the United States as well. It was not until 1904, under the leadership of President Joseph F. Smith, that plural marriage was banned finally and completely everywhere in the world by the church. Uh, I don't even think it was uh, finally banned then. <laughs> I think it kind of went on a little later than 1904. Okay, a book by Edward L. Kimball and Andrew E. Kimball Jr. Spencer W. Kimball, 12th president of the church, Bookcraft, 1977. Uh, the prophet Spencer W. Kimball apparently approved of this biography of himself. Uh, so the Kimballs uh, say there was little or no stigma on polygamy entered into in Mexico after the manifesto. No stigma. All right, back to Francis M. Gibbons' book. I'm surprised he's so honest about this stuff. He's usually not in his books. Uh, this is the book on Joseph F. Smith again. 
Uh, as to the scope of the proclamation or the manifesto, certain members, including some who occupied positions of high leadership, interesting, contended that the instrument applied only to plural marriages performed within the United States and its territories. Well, there were some plural marriages performed in the U.S. as well. Okay, uh, Gibbons continues here. Uh, under this view, plural marriages performed outside the United States, for example, in Mexico or Canada, were immune from the proscriptions of the manifesto. All right, uh, an article in the Salt Lake Tribune, no November 1st, 1910, and Quinn points this out. Uh, the anti-Mormon Salt Lake Tribune estimated in 1910 that there were, were about 2,000 plural marriages performed between 1890 and 1904, which was echoed by the schismatic Mormon fundamentalists 40 years later. So the Tribune in 1910 saying about 2,000 plural marriages performed. Isn't that a little bit more than a few? Okay, statement by Quinn. Uh, the official and semi-official publications of the church have simply rephrased the First Presidency's 1907 statement that there, that there were few, quote-unquote, new plural marriages from 1890 to 1904. Apparently they have rephrased this. All right, back to Arrington and Biden's book, The Mormon Experience, 1979, Arrington pictured above. Uh, perhaps a few score new plural marriages occurred between 1890 and uh, 1904, according to Arrington and Biden. A, a few score. Well, how, how much is a few score? 40, 60, 80, 100 maybe? Eh, probably more than that. All right. Lawyer and historian Kenneth L. Cannon II came out with an article called After the Manifesto, Mormon Polygamy, 1890 to 1906 in Sunstone in 1983. See the cover of Sunstone up here on the right. Uh, Cannon came up with an annual statistical chart of 150 polygamous marriages from 1890 to 1904. So he, he says 150 which apparently caused a dramatic shift in the official presentation of numbers. 150 more than a few? Yeah, I'd say so. Here you can see the title of his article, After the Manifesto, Mormon Polygamy, etc. Canon, pictured up here on the left. D. Michael Quinn says that there were several inaccuracies in Canon's chart, however. So uh, maybe we'll get to some even better numbers than this. I can't remember. Okay, this is what Gibbon says. And remember, he's secretary of the First Presidency, so he, he may have access to some documents. As of 1904, a comparatively large number of polygamous marriages had been performed after the manifesto. Comparatively large number, he says. All right, what does the church-owned Desert Evening News say in 1911? Uh, they say there is absolutely no truth in the allegation that plural marriages have been entered into with the sanction of the church since the manifesto. All right, uh, Apostle John A. Widso also says the same lie in a book uh, called Program of the Church of Je Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, Department of Education, 1936. Didn't even know this book existed. Uh, Widso says, uh, says, since that day, October 6, 1890, no plural marriage has been performed with the sanction or authority of the church. Uh, no. Okay, a BYU historian, Gustav O. Larson, Outline History of Utah and the Mormons, Desert Book, 1958 book. While Presidents Woodruff, Snow, and Smith maintain monogamous integrity of the church, not sure what that means, plural marriages were being performed secretly by two members of the Apostles' Quorum. Now, did they have the approval of Woodruff, Snow, and Smith? We'll get to that. All right. Uh, Stephen L. Richards, member of the First Presidency, I believe, put out a pamphlet, I think, uh, called About Mormonism, Desert News Press, 1961. See, pictured on the left and uh, Richards on the right. 
Uh, since that time, 1890, entering into plural marriage has been construed to be an offense against the laws of the church. Eh, not really. All right, a statement from Apostle Gordon B. Hinckley would go on to be the president of the church. This is from his book, Truth Restored, A Short History of the Church, 1969. So you'll notice these are all old sources because uh, my main source was Quinn's 1985 paper. Uh, I could have added some more modern sources, uh, but I think Quinn did a, a pretty adequate job. Uh, so Gordon B. Hinckley says, Since that time, September 1890, the church has neither practiced nor sanctioned such polygamous marriage. Mm, no, that's not true, Hinckley. Okay, a statement from the Apostle Marky e. Peterson, The Way of the Master, Bookcraft, 1974. Uh, Peterson says, The manifesto put an end to all legal plural marriages. An end to all of them. No, not true. All right, some interesting information from the Mormon fundamentalist publication, Truth. To January 1937, I believe this is a fundamentalist uh, newspaper or a newsletter. Uh, they say, uh, by this action of President John Taylor in 1886, which it must be assumed was taken in accordance with instructions from the Lord, additional machinery for the continuance of the celestial order of marriage was set up. So this is four years before the manifesto. Uh, it had been entered into by members of the priesthood, wholly apart and independent of the church. So that's interesting. Okay, same source here, January 1937. Uh, it was under this authority, conferred under the hands of Prophet John Taylor, that Anthony W. Ivans exercised the sealing powers in Mexico after the church adopted the manifesto. So after the manifesto. Under the, under the authority of the prophet John Taylor, setting up Anthony W. Ivans uh, to continue uh, sealing people in polygamy in Mexico. Anthony W. Ivans uh, would later become an apostle, and it, he would go into the first presidency. Uh, he is uh, pictured above. All right, same source, a Mormon fundamentalist publication called uh, Truth. And this is Truth number two. Uh, it was by this authority that Apostles John Henry Smith and John W. Taylor and Abraham Owen Woodruff and others joined people in the patriarchal order of marriage or polygamy after the issuance of the manifesto. These are high-level people uh, joining in the patriarchal order of marriage, joining in uh, or, and, and uh, ordaining and marrying people under polygamy. After the manifesto, pictured above, we have apostles uh, John Henry Smith on the left and uh, Abraham Owen Woodruff on the right, uh, who I believe is the son of Wilford Woodruff. Okay, same source here in 1937. Uh, it was by the same authority that Abraham H. Cannon, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve, entered into plural marriage after the manifesto. So in interesting. One of the apostles entering into plural marriage. The church neither approved nor disapproved these several actions. And pictured above is the apostle uh, Abraham H. Cannon. All right, the church newspaper Desert Evening News uh, with some lies here uh, from the apostle Brigham Young, Jr., uh, the son of the prophet Brigham Young. Desert Evening News, January 13, 1891, and also Desert News Weekly, January 17, 1891. And I think this is uh, Quinn's language here. He says, four months after Wilford Woodruff announced the manifesto, editions of the Desert News published Apostle Brigham Young Jr.'s denial that the Mormons had established a polygamous refuge in Mexico. Brigham Young Jr., the apostle, denying this. Uh, and then he says, The Mormons are a law-abiding people. They have found stringent laws in Mexico prohibiting the practice of polygamy, which laws they have respected and obeyed in every particular. Nope. Uh, Brigham Young Jr. was lying, and uh, he is pictured above. 
Okay, a speech uh, here from Wilford Woodruff. This is when he was an apostle. Journal of Discourses, December 12th, 1869. So, uh... What, like uh, 20 years, tw 21 years before the manifesto. Uh, Wilford says, if we were to do away with polygamy, it would only be one feather in the bird, one ordinance in the church and kingdom. And then I guess he would say, you're going to have to take out other feathers too, right? He's going to take out important uh, doctrines, important ordinances. You, do, you go down a slippery slope. Okay, the Apostle Wilfred Woodruff continues here in 1869. Uh, do away with polygamy, then we must do away with prophets and apostles. Do away, do away with prophets and apostles and you don't have a church anymore, right? So a very different language from Wilford than what he would say 20 years later in the manifesto. Uh, we must do away with revelation and the gifts and graces of the gospel if we're going to get rid of polygamy. And finally, give up our religion altogether and turn sectarians and do as the world does, then all would be right. So they were very hesitant to change this doctrine of polygamy. Wilford pictured above in his younger days. All right, the Apostle uh, Woodruff continues. Uh, we just can't do that. Can't give up polygamy. For God has commanded us to build up his kingdom and to bear our testimony to the nations of the earth. I guess that polygamy is true and good, and we are going to do it, come life or come death. Nope. <laughs> Woodruff would be willing to give up polygamy uh, later on, at least in public, right? All right, Wilford continues, uh, God has told us to do thus, to keep polygamy, and we shall obey him, in days to come as we have in days past. Okay, some more information from the Apostle Wilfred Woodruff in his journal, January 26, 1880 entry, so about 10 years before the manifesto. Wilfred Woodruff com of a completely different opinion than the language in the manifesto. In fact, this is going to be a revelation from the Apostle Wilfred Woodruff. He is called as a prophet, seer, and, and revelator, right? So he can give revelations to the church. He is an apostle, just like the 12 apostles of the Bible, right? So at this time, Wilford Woodruff was the second ranking apostle in the church. He dictated revelation in January 26th of 1880, accepted as the word of the Lord by the Quorum of the Twelve the following April. So this is pretty much a revelation accepted by the church. And I say again, woe unto that nation or house or people who seek to hinder my people from obeying the patriarchal law of Abraham. What is the patriarchal law of Abraham? That's polygamy. Which leadeth to a celestial glory, polygamy does, which has been revealed unto my saints through the mouth of my servant Joseph. That's Joseph Smith. For whosoever doeth these things shall be damned, saith the Lord of hosts. I uh, guess uh, give up uh, polygamy. Or those who seek to hinder my people from obeying the law of polygamy. Uh, they shall be damned and shall be broken up and washed away from under heaven by the judgments which I, the Lord God, have sent forth and shall not return unto me void. All right, the Apostle Wilfred Woodruff continues here, writing down this revelation in his journal in 1880. And thus with the sword and by bloodshed and with famine and plagues and earthquakes and the thunders of heavens and the vivid lightning shall this nation, the U.S., and the nations of the earth be made to feel the chastening hand of an almighty God until they are broken up and destroyed. This is what happens if you give up polygamy, right? And wasted away from under heaven, and no power can stay my hand, uh, the Almighty God. So we have a bloody sword pictured above. We have famine here. Maybe in Africa, we have uh, the plague, uh, pictured by the symbol of this guy in the middle. We have earthquakes that rip up roads. We have uh, thunder and lightning. 
All right, Wilford continues in this uh, revelation. Therefore, let the wicked tremble. Let them that blaspheme my name hold their lips, for destruction will swiftly overtake them. So I guess since the uh, church um, gave up polygamy, they're going to be destroyed. Maybe you could say uh, that the church is in apostasy now. All right, the Apostle Wilford continues. Uh, if we were to give up polygamy today, we would have to give up revelation, prophets, apostles, temple ordinances, and the church itself. Well, Wilf Wilford, with the manifesto, started us down that slippery slope to give up polygamy, right? So have we given up uh, revelation, prophets, apostles, temples, ordinances? Have we given up the church? No, they, they kind of limp along, right, without the original doctrines. All right, so uh, the prophet Wilford Woodruff completely does a 180 here. Uh, here's the language of the official declaration one, or also known as the manifesto. You can find this at the end of the Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, in there, it's supposedly signed by the prophet Wilford Woodruff, September 24th, 1890. Starts out uh, with saying, to whom it may concern. Uh, press dispatches have been sent for political purposes from Salt Lake City, which have been widely published to the effect that the Utah Commission, in their recent report to the Secretary of the Interior, alleged that plural marriages are still being solemnized and that 40 or more such marriages have been contracted in Utah since last June or during the past year. That's probably true. Also, that in public discourses, the leaders of the church have taught, encouraged, and urged the continuance of the practice of polygamy. This according to the Utah Commission. All right. Uh, the language of the manifesto continues here. It's in the Mormon scripture, right? Doctrine and Covenants. Uh, I, therefore, as president of the church, Wilford Woodruff, do hereby in the most solemn manner declare that these charges are false. We are not teaching polygamy or plural marriage, nor permitting any person to enter into its practice. And I deny that either 40 or any other number of plural marriages have during that period been solemnized in our temples or in any other place in the territory. So, of course, uh, he's lying. <laughs> All right, the manifesto continues here. Uh, Wilford admits that maybe there was one <laughs> polygamous marriage. There's a lot more than that. Uh, one case has been reported in which the parties allege that the marriage was performed in the endowment house in Salt Lake City in the spring of 1889. But I have not been able to learn who performed the ceremony. Whatever was done in this matter was without my knowledge. In consequence of this alleged occurrence, the endowment house was, by my instructions, taken down without delay. So because of one polygamous marriage, they took down the endowment house? Uh, probably not the reason why, right? Okay, some more language of the manifesto here. Uh, Inasmuch as the laws have been enacted by Congress forbidding plural marriages, which laws have been pronounced constitutional by the court of last resort, I guess the U.S. Supreme Court, I hereby declare my intention to submit to those laws and to use my influence with the members of the church over which I preside to have them do likewise. Going to obey the laws of the land, right? Well, they didn't. All right, Wilford Woodruff continues here in the manifesto, uh, if we're to believe that he's the one that wrote this. Uh, there is nothing in my teachings to the church or in those of my associates during the time specified which can be reasonably construed to inculcate or encourage polygamy. And when, and when any elder of the church has used language which appeared to convey any such teaching, he has been promptly reproved. And I now publicly declare that my advice to the Latter-day Saints is to refrain from contracting any marriage forbidden by the law of the land. All right, so after the uh, Manifesto and the Doctrine and Covenants, 
there is a statement from uh, Lorenzo Snow, who was the president of the 12 at the time. Uh, and he says the following, uh, Lorenzo, I move that recognizing Wilford Woodruff as the president of the church and the only man on the earth at the present time who holds the keys of the sealing ordinances, we consider him fully authorized by virtue of his position to issue the manifesto which has been read in our hearing and which is dated September 24th, 1890. And that as a church in general conference assembled, we accept his we accept his declaration concerning plural marriages as authoritative and binding. The vote to sustain the foregoing motion was unanimous. Salt Lake City, Utah, October 6, 1890. All right, uh, we're going to go through some excerpts from three addresses or speeches by President Wilford Woodruff regarding the manifesto. This is from the 61st semi-annual General Conference of the Church, Monday, October 6, 1890, Salt Lake City, Utah, reported in the Desert Evening News, October 11, 1890. So, a speech uh, by Wilford Woodruff here. Uh, he says, The Lord will never permit me, Wilford, or any other man who stands as president of this church to lead you astray. It is not in the program and is not in the mind of God. If I were to attempt that, the Lord would remove me out of my place. And so he, the Lord, will will any other man who attempts to lead the children of men astray from the oracles of God and from their duty. Well, he's directly going against a revelation he received uh, 10 years earlier, right, that we read. All right, another statement or speech by the prophet Wilford Woodruff, Cash Stake Conference, Logan, Utah, Sunday, November 1st, 1891, reported in the Desert Weekly, November 14, 1891. I believe this is also in the Doctrine and Covenants. Wilford says, it matters not who lives or who dies or who is called to lead the church. They have got to lead the church by the inspiration of Almighty God. If they do not do that, uh, if they do not do it that way, they cannot do it at all. Uh, pictured above the Logan Temple. Okay, Wilford continues here at this cash stake conference. Uh, I have had some revelations of late. Oh, did they disagree with your former uh, revelations? Uh, and very important ones to me, and I will tell you, what the Lord has said to me, let me bring your minds to what is termed the manifesto. All right, the prophet Wilford Woodruff continues here. Uh, the Lord has told me to ask the Latter-day Saints a question. And he also told me that if they would listen to what I said to them and answer the question put to them by the spirit and power of God, they would all answer alike. And they would all believe alike with regard to this matter. Okay, the Prophet Wilford Woodruff at the Cash State Conference, November 14, 1891. He's going to change his tune from what he said 10 years ago, 11 years ago. Uh, the question is this, uh, which is the wisest course for the Latter-day Saints to pursue? To continue to attempt to practice plural marriage with the laws of the nation against it, and the opposition of 60 millions of people and at the cost of the confiscation and loss of all the temples and the stopping of all the ordinances therein, both for the living and the dead and the imprisonment of the first presidency and the 12 and the heads of families in the church and the confiscation of personal property of the people uh, or after doing and suffering what we have through our adherence to this principle, the plural marriage, to cease the practice and submit to the law, and through doing so, we will leave the prophets, apostles, and fathers at home, I guess instead of prison, so that they can instruct the people and attend to the duties of the church, and also leave the temples in the hands of the saints so that they can attend to the ordinances of the gospel, both for the living and the dead. So he said, you know, we're going to have to give up our temples. We're not going to be able to do work for the dead. 
But uh, 10, 11 years earlier, he says the church is going to be completely annihilated and destroyed if they give up polygamy. So which is it, Wilford? Okay, Wilford continues in the same speech. Uh, the Lord showed me by vision and revelation exactly what would take place if we did not stop this practice. Uh, if we had not stopped it, you would have had no use for any of the men in this temple at Logan, for all ordinances would be stopped throughout the land of Zion. All right, the prophet uh, continues, Wilfred Woodruff. Uh, confusion would reign throughout Israel. It's interesting that they call uh, Mormon land in uh, Utah Israel. Uh, and many men would be made prisoners. This trouble would have come upon the whole church and we should have been compelled to stop the practice. All right, Wilford continues. Uh, now the question is whether polygamy should be stopped in this manner or in the way that the Lord has manifested to us and leave our prophets and apostles and fathers free men and the temples in the hands of the people so that the dead may be redeemed. Okay, he continues. Uh, he says, A large number has already been delivered from the prison house in the spirit world by this people, and shall the work go on or stop? Uh, this is the question I lay before the Latter-day Saints. You have to judge for yourself. All right, Wilford continues here. I want you to answer it for yourselves. I shall not answer it, but I say to you that that is exactly the condition that we as a people would have been, been in uh, had we not taken the course that we have. I saw exactly what would come to pass if there was not something done. I have had this spirit upon me for a long time. Well, not for more than 10 or 11 years. <laughs> um all right, so maybe he's thinking uh, we can still do some, you know, polygamous marriages on the down low here. All right, Wilford continues here at the Cash Stake Conference. And uh, this is also in the Doctrine and Covenants, so maybe you could say this is canonized. I'm not sure. Uh, Wilford says, but I want to say this. I should have let all the temples go out of our hands. I should have gone to prison myself and let every other man go there, had not the God of heaven commanded me to do what I did do. And when the hour came that I was commanded to do that, it was all clear to me. I went before the Lord, and I wrote what the Lord told me to write. Oh, and it just happened to be completely opposite of what he told you ten years ago. Uh, I leave this with you for you to contemplate and consider. The Lord is at work with us. Uh, well, not according to you 10 years ago. Uh, you should have been destroyed, Wilford. Okay, the third speech we're going to talk about uh, from the prophet uh, Wilford Woodruff is from a discourse at the sixth session of the dedication of the Salt Lake Temple, April 1893. There's a ticket to get into this session here that I hadn't seen before that I put on the slide. Salt Lake Temple Dedication Services, admit one, Tuesday, April 11th, 1893, morning session signed by Wilford Woodruff. All right, so Wilford says uh, in this speech, uh, now I will tell you what has manifested to me and what the Son of God performed in this thing. All these things would have come to pass that we've read about. As God Almighty lives, had not that manifesto been given. Okay, same speech here, April 1893. Uh, this is also in the Doctrine and Covenants, all three of these speeches. So you could probably make an argument that these are canonized. Uh, Prophet Wilfred Woodruff again, therefore the Son of God felt disposed to have that thing presented to the church and to the world for purposes in his own mind the Lord had decreed the establishment of Zion. Here we have uh, the Salt Lake uh, Temple being finished up here. Uh, it says, laying the capstones of the great Mormon temple, April 6, 1893. So right, right around this time frame, uh, people were singing Hosanna, Salt Lake City, Utah.
Okay, Wilford continues. Uh, he, I guess the Lord, had decreed the finishing of this temple, the Salt Lake Temple. He had decreed that the salvation of the living and the dead should be given in these valleys of the mountains. All right, and the Almighty God decreed that the devil should not thwart it. Should not thwart uh, the building of the temple, right? And the, the work for the dead. Uh, if you can understand that, that is a key to it. Oh, the big grand key. Pictured above on the right uh, is the devil <laughs> in a certain sense. He represented the devil in the temple endowment ceremony for quite a while. Okay, let's move on to another source. Uh, the First Presidency Secretary, George F. Gibbs, pictured above in a letter to Bernard Greensfelder, November 8, 1915, First Presidency letter book, which Quinn had access to. He had good access. Uh, President Woodruff's manifesto of 1890, abandoning the practice of polygamy, was not intended to apply to Mexico. Well, that's not what Joseph uh, F. Smith said in the Reed Smoot hearings. Uh, and did not, as the church was not dealing with the Mexican government, but only with our own government, uh, and for the further reason that the Mexican government extended the hand of welcome to Mormon polygamous. All right, but what about all of the polygamous wives of the prophet and the apostles? Uh, this was a meeting of the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve, October 7th, 1890, First Presidency Office Journal. President Woodruff drew the attention of the brethren to the fact that the manifesto did not affect our present family relations, but it simply stated that all plural marriages had ceased. All right, some information from the prophet Wilford Woodruff recorded in a uh, Apostle Abraham H. Cannon's diary, October 7, 1890. Uh, this manifesto only refers to future marriages and does not affect past conditions. I did not, could not, and would not promise that you would desert your wives and children. This you cannot do in honor, uh, according to Prophet uh, Wilford Woodruff. All right, but what do they say in public? <laughs> Prophet Wilford Woodruff and uh, in the First Presidency, George Q. Cannon, Salt Lake Times, June 23, 1891. Uh, would you or any officer of the church authorize a polygamous marriage or countenance the practice of unlawful cohabitation, living with your wives? Again, we, uh, we have to, again, we have to say that we can only speak for ourselves and say that we would not authorize any such marriage or any practice violative of the law. So I guess they were not supposed to live with their wives, right? And uh, Pro the prophet Wilford Woodruff and George Q. Cannon are saying, no, we don't live with our wives. All right, a statement from the prophet Wilford Woodruff, uh, First Presidency Office Journal, August 20, 1891. Uh, Brethren, you may call it inspiration or revelation. That is the manifesto. It could be inspiration, could be revelation. Or what you please. As for me, I am satisfied that it is from the Lord. Okay, Prophet Wilford Woodruff, a transcript of a testimony before the Master in Chancery, October 6, 1891. Uh, Woodford gives an answer here to a question. Uh, any person entering into plural marriage after the date of September 24, 1890 would be liable to become excommunicated from the church. Not really what happened, though, however. Uh, pictured above the September 6, D. Michael Quinn, Lynn Whitesides, Lavina Anderson, Paul Toscano, Max Maxine Hanks, Avram Gileadi. Okay, same source here, the prophet Wilford Woodruff. Uh, question. In the concluding portion of your statement uh, in the manifesto, do you understand that the language was to be expanded and to include the further statement of living or associating in plural marriage by those already in the status? Uh, Wilford answers, yes, sir. I intended the proclamation to cover the ground, to keep the laws, to obey the law myself, and expected the people to obey the law. All right, the prophet Wilford Woodruff continues in the same source. Uh, question, was the manifesto intended to apply to the church everywhere? 
Answer, yes, sir. Question, in every nation and every country? Answer, yes, sir, as far as I had any knowledge in the matter. Uh, but this is not what the church did, though. They, they started doing a, a bunch in Mexico. All right, uh, question. In places outside of the United States as well as within the United States? Answer, yes, sir. We are given no liberties for entering into that anywhere. Polygamy. Not, they're not going to enter into polygamy anywhere. Uh, entering into that principle. Okay, same source here, a uh, transcript of a testimony before the master in Chancery, October 6, 1891, Prophet Wilfred Woodruff. Uh, question, your attention was called to the fact that nothing is said in this manifesto about the dissolution of the existing polygamous relations. I want to ask you, President Woodruff, whether in your advice to the church officials and the people of the church, you have advised them that your intention was and that their requirement of the church was that the polygamous relations already formed before the manifesto should not be continued. That is, there should be no association with plural wives. In other words, that unlawful cohabitation as it is named and spoken of should also stop as well as future polygamous marriages. Wilford answers, yes, sir, that has been the intention. He is totally lying here. Uh, pretty much all the prophets and apostles uh, kept uh, th their wives that they uh, had married before the manifesto. All right, the prophet Wilford Woodruff again in the First Presidency Office Journal, October 21st, 1891. The manifesto was just as authoritative and binding as though it had been given in the form of thus saith the Lord and that it's affecting unlawful cohabitation cases was but the logical sequence of its scope and intent regarding polygamous marriages as the law of the land forbid both. It forbids unlawful cohabitation. In other words, living with your polygamous wives that you'd already married before the manifesto. And that therefore, although he at the time did not perceive the far-reaching effect that it would have, no other ground could be taken than that which he had taken and be consistent with the position that the manifesto had placed us in. But uh, this is not what the uh, the leaders did. <laughs> All right, so here is some evidence uh, that the leaders of the church did continue in unlawful cohabitation. This is from Kenneth Cannon II uh, in an article in the Utah Historical Quarterly, winter of 1978. Article is called Beyond the Manifesto, Polygamous Cohabitation Among the General Authorities After 1890. You can see the cover of the Utah Historical Quarterly, the title up here above. Uh, most, so this is Cannon uh, talking, Kenneth Cannon II. Uh, most pre-1890 polygamists and every polygamous general authority continued to cohabit with their plural wives of childbearing age. So those public statements that we had read and the answers that the prophet Wilford Woodruff uh, gave uh, in the previous slides, those are lies. That's not what they did. They, they all continued to live uh, with their polygamous wives. Uh, published, family, published family histories and other genealogical records demonstrate that this was a widespread pattern. All right, some information from uh, President and Apostle George Q. Cannon at a temple meeting of the presidency and apostles. So he's in the first presidency. This shows up in Abraham H. Cannon's diary, April 5th, 1894. So what, about four years after the manifesto? Uh, Cannon says, I believe in concubinage, kind of as talked about in the uh, Old Testament, or some plan whereby men and women can live together under sacred ordinances and vows until they can be married. So maybe this was another idea that Cannon had, that they could have concubines <laughs> uh, because marriages uh, were outlawed. All right, and the prophet Wilfred Woodruff actually agrees with George Q. Cannon here. Same temple meeting, Abraham H. Cannon diary, same date. If And this is Wilfred Woodruff speaking. If men enter into some practice uh, like concubinage or of the character of concubinage to raise a righteous posterity, they will be justified in it. This is four years after the manifesto, uh, folks. 
All right, a statement from Quinn. Uh, 90% of new polygamous marriages contracted from September 1890 through December 1904 directly involve church authority. 90% folks involve church authority. So all those other statements that we read that there wasn't church authority sanctioning these things, those are not true. All right, Quinn continues here. Uh, from the publication of the manifesto until November of 1890, the first presidency authorized seven residents of the United States to go to Mexico to be married there. All right, Quinn continues. Uh, two marriages were performed in 1891 for residents of the Mexican colonies upon verbal authorization transmitted to the resident apostle there. Pictured above, we have a Mormon temple in Juarez, Chihuahua, Mexico. We have an old building uh, that was in the Mexican colonies here on the right. Um, I'm not sure if that's a school building. And uh, Quinn continues. In July of 1892, the first presidency authorized a couple of marriages to be performed in Mexico and Canada. All right, uh, Quinn continues here. Uh, in 1893, the first presidency authorized only one U.S. resident to visit Mexico for a plural marriage ceremony, and only one was performed there for a local resident. Pictured above a uh, map of the LDS colonies in Mexico. Uh, pretty interesting. I'm sure there's still some people down there. Uh, I guess you can pause this and, uh, and read those names if you want to. All right, Quinn uh, continues here. Uh, in 1894, the first presidency committed themselves to the position that there were circumstances under which plural marriages would not only be permitted, but also encouraged. This was four years after the manifesto. And by the authority of the presidency, one plural marriage occurred in Canada, six plural marriages occurred in Mexico, and two in Utah temples. Uh, this pattern continued about the same in 1895 and 1896, so for uh, about three years here. All right, Quinn uh, continues. Uh, two apostles visited the Mexican colonies early in 1897 and performed plural marriages for two residents. All right, Quinn uh, continues here. Uh, all these are pictures of Quinn. Uh, during the last six months of 1897, the first presidency authorized seven U.S. residents to visit Mexico for plural marriage ceremonies. Seven residents. And also authorized two ceremonies to occur aboard a ship. All right, continuing on here in the same source uh, by Quinn. Uh, during 1898, mounting pressures for polygamy resulted in an expansion of orderly avenues for performing new plural marriages. What were these orderly avenues? Uh, the first presidency authorized nine more U.S. residents to visit the Juarez stake in Mexico for their polygamous ceremonies. So nine more. Again, this is that building, again, from the front, a little bit better uh, resolution. Might be a school. Uh, might I don't think that's a church, but... All right, same source here by Quinn. Uh, toward the end of the year, the first presidency instructed the Juarez stake in Mexico, instructed that, that stake president to perform plural marriages for worthy residents of the stake without obtaining specific authorization from the first presidency for individual cases. So they kind of went out on their own, uh, kind of under the understanding, though, that they would be approved. There is a history about these colonies called the history of the Mormon colonies in Mexico, the War at Stake. Uh, it might be kind of an interesting book to look at. All right, uh, Quinn continues here. Uh, during 1899, plural marriages were being performed in Mexico and in various places in the United States. Uh, but because anti-Mormons began publishing accusations of these violations of the manifesto, church authorities began excommunicating a few new polygamists. Excommun excommunicating a few, kind of token excommunications, right? And again, another picture, a better resolution of that uh, temple in Mexico. Juarez Chihuahua, I think they said. 
Okay, Quinn continues here uh, talking about Lorenzo Snow. Uh, in January of 1900, the church president, Lorenzo Snow, uh, or the prophet of the church, uh, made a public denial that either new polygamous marriages or polygamous cohabitation had his or the church's sanction. So obviously he's lying. So what did the Quorum of the Twelve think about this statement from uh, Snow? They, well, they didn't like it. Uh, in the quarterly meeting of the Quorum of the Twelve that began the day after this announcement, nearly all of the apostles expressed opposition to the publicly announced position of the church president, Snow. All right, so another statement here from Quinn. Same article. Uh, later in the year of 1900, a split developed within the First Presidency itself because of the President's refusal to authorize the Juarez State President to continue to perform plural marriages in Mexico. The President uh, is, is Snow. Uh, one of the counselors in the First Presidency personally authorized the performance of a plural marriage in Mexico for a man whom the Church President had specifically refused. So now we're starting to have conflict and disagreement within the First Presidency and uh, uh, probably within the Quorum of the Twelve. All right, Quinn continues. Uh, the counselor in the First Presidency also commissioned a patriarch in the Juarez stake to perform plural marriages for the residents of the Mexican colonies without the knowledge or authorization of the church president. And that's Snow. Uh, Pictured above, Colonia Juarez, commemorating 125 years of the Mormon colonies in Mexico. Okay, Quinn continues. Uh, in 1901, the church president continued to refuse to authorize the Juarez stake president to perform plural marriages in Mexico, but marriages continued there anyway because of the separate avenue established by his counselor in the first presidency. All right, same source here from Quinn. Uh, Latter-day Saints of prominent church position continue to enter into polygamy in Utah on the basis of still another authorized avenue. The church president compounded the confusion by authorizing several apostles individually to marry plural wives at the same time that he refused to give the apostles generally that permission. So we got a lot of confusion going on, a lot of disagreements. All right, uh, the public and private messages on new plural marriages had become so muddy by 1901 that prominent church authorities became opponents or advocates of new plural marriages, sincerely believing that they had first presidency authorization for their contradictory positions. <laughs> opponents thought they were support, supported by the first presidency and advocates of plural marriage thought they had uh, support. So we had a lot of confusion here. On September 11, 1901, the Deseret Evening News branded as groundless and utterly false the statement of a Protestant minister that one of the apostles had recently taken an additional wife. That's supposedly false, right, according to the church. When in fact, four apostles had married plural wives so far that year. <laughs> so you can see the Desert News is lying here in 1901 and four apostles actually took plural wives. Okay, in 1902, uh, the church president uh, was Joseph F. Smith and he authorized the Juarez stake president to resume performing plural marriages for Mexican uh, colonists who were also having their polygamous union solemnized by the stake patriarch and visiting apostles. Okay, the year of 1903 was the climax of post-manifesto polygamy with church authority. Apostles were performing new polygamous marriages in the United States and Mexico, where both the stake patriarch and president were also officiating for residents of the Juarez stake. All right, the story continues here from Quinn. Uh, the stake president had furthermore been authorized by the first presidency to perform plural marriages for U.S. residents with the necessary letter from Salt Lake City. 
In addition, for the first time since the establishment of the Canadian Settlement of Mormons, the church president authorized local church authority to perform plural marriages there for Canadian Mormons. And uh, th this is Joseph F. Smith now as president. All right. In 1904, uh, with the investigation of the church and new plural marriages by the U.S. Senate, church authority and new plural marriages went into a rapid decline. The second manifesto ended some avenues of church authority for new plural marriages that year, uh, but not others. Other avenues were still open. All right, let's get to some individual stories here. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, President Wilford Woodruff in 1890. This is a story from uh, Byron H. Allred in his diary, October 4th, 1890 entry. Uh, when Byron H. Allred asked for permission to marry the young woman who accompanied him to the president's office on October 4th, 1890, uh, President Woodruff patiently explained the reasons that he had issued the manifesto and then told Allred to move as soon as possible with his intended plural wife to Mexico, where Alexander F. MacDonald would perform the ceremony. So uh, the manifesto's out, but Wilford is, is saying to, to Allred, just go down to Mexico and you can get married down there. Uh, uh, pictured above, Alexander F. MacDonald. All right, another account from uh, Anson Bowen Call in his autobiography. Uh, I guess he's pictured above here. Uh, Anson B. Call was bold enough to come to uh, Wilford Woodruff's own home about the same time and found the president hoeing strawberries. Uh, president Woodruff told him to sell all of his property in the United States and move to Mexico with his intended wife. Upon his arrival in Colonia Juarez on December 11, 1890, Anson B. Call was married in polygamy by Alexander F. MacDonald, just like on the last slide. Uh, to whom my note of recognition from President Woodruff was addressed. So he had a, a note from uh, Woodruff. MacDonald said that he had been expecting them for a long time and married them immediately. All right, an account from uh, Abraham H. Cannon in his diary, November 12, 1891. Uh, Cannon's pictured above. President Woodruff told the First Presidency and the Twelve on November 12, 1891, that any man who deserts and neglects his wives or children because of the manifesto should be handled on his fellowship. So he's encouraging unlawful cohabitation here. All right, same source here. Uh, the prophet Wilford Woodruff then encouraged the assembled general authorities to agree that men must try to avoid being arrested or convicted for unlawful cohabitation must try to avoid it, and yet they must not break their covenants with their wives. So sounds like Woodruff never really intended to follow the law uh, as far as unlawful cohabitation went. Okay, back to Quinn. Uh, in July of 1892, President Woodruff consented to renewing the performance of plural marriage in Mexico for a few men who continued to pester him for that privilege. All right. Uh, although Woodruff personally signed the recommends for the polygamous marriages performed between October and December of 1890, President Woodruff thereafter tried to distance himself as president of the church from future authorizations. Uh, pictured above Wilford Woodruff's uh, signature. Okay. Uh, an account uh, from the president and Apostle George Q. Cannon. He's in the first presidency. Uh, to George Teasdale, a letter July 18, 1892, concerning a plural marriage for Rasmus Larson, First Presidency Letter Book. Uh, Teasdale is pictured above, I believe. Uh, Woodruff's counselor, George Q. Cannon, indicated that the distance was not very great when he copied in the First Presidency Letter Book the following authorization to Apostle George Teasdale, for the first plural marriage for a non-resident of the Mexican colonies since the end of 1890. 
Uh, it will be quite satisfactory to all of us, to all of us, for you to render him the services which he needs. So go ahead and marry uh, Rasmus Larson to a polygamous wife. All right, Abraham H. Cannon's diary, April 5th, 1894, still here on uh, George Q. Cannon. At the meeting of the presidency and 12 in the Salt Lake Temple on April 5th, 1894, President Cannon expressed regrets that there were no provisions for polygamous marriages. Uh, to which President Woodruff replied, the day is near when there will be no difficulty in the way of good men securing noble wives. And that hasn't happened, right? Polygamy is still illegal here in 2023. Okay, another source here, uh, Franklin S. Bramwell to Joseph F. Smith, December 25th, 1914. He says that Apostle Brigham Young Jr. performed at least five plural marriages in Mexico. When he returned in May uh, and June, or May through June of 1894, among these plural marriages was one for Franklin S. Bramwell, then a stake high councilman, who later wrote, "When I took my second wife, I had a letter signed by President Woodruff himself." and went to Mexico with a personal letter from President George Q. Cannon. So these are authorized right, right from the top, right? Uh, I think pictured above is Apostle Brigham Young Jr. in his uh, younger days. Okay, going back to Abraham H. Cannon's diary, October 19th, 1894. In October of 1894, President Woodruff personally authorized Apostle Abraham H. Cannon to marry a new plural wife. Uh, his father, George Q. Cannon, also spoke to me about taking some good girl and raising up seed by her for my brother David. Such a ceremony as this could be performed in Mexico, so President Woodruff has said. Uh, President Woodruff's permission was enthusiastic, not grudging, as indicated in the second reference to this prospective polygamous marriage in Cannon's diary for October 24th, so about five days later. He says, President Woodruff promised the Lord's blessing uh, to follow such an act. Uh, of course, all this information is from Quinn. All right. Uh, six months later, Wilford Woodruff gave a newspaper interview in the Salt Lake Tribune, May 9th, 1895. Woodruff says, I hurl defiance at the world to prove that the manifesto forbidding plural marriages has not been observed. Well, it wasn't observed. <laughs> Woodruff tells one thing to the public and another uh, in private, as I've gone through in so many of my videos. Uh, it's a pattern in, in, in so many things in the church. Okay, some interesting information in the Ivans papers, Utah State Historical Society in Salt Lake City, Anthony W. Ivans marriage record as well, and then Temple Book B. Uh, in June of 1897, the First Presidency authorized Juarez Stake President Anthony W. Ivans to perform polygamous uh, ceremonies in Mexico. And in the fall, President Woodruff authorized Apostle Anthon H. Lund to perform two plural marriages aboard a ship, one on the Pacific Ocean and one on the Great Lakes. Apostle Anthon H. Lund pictured above. Okay, Anthon H. Lund, diary, December 1st, 1897. Uh, President Woodruff met with Apostle Anthon H. Lund on December 1st of 1897, apparently to authorize the aboard ship ceremony that Lund would perform exactly one month later en route uh, to Palestine. All right, it seems uh, that the prophet Wilford Woodruff actually had a polygamous marriage in 1897, so what, about seven years after the manifesto. Uh, this is all from Quinn. Uh, although, although there is no presently available document that records the sealing ceremony specifically, the evidence seems compelling that L. John Nuttall performed a polygamous marriage for the prophet Wilford Woodruff and Madam Lydia Mary Mountford aboard a ship on the Pacific Ocean on September 20, 1897. So that, that's pretty big uh, information, historical information that 
the prophet himself, Wilford Woodruff, was was taking a, a plural wife. Um, I'm not sure who's pictured above. Uh, I think that's L. John Nuttall. All right. Uh, Quinn continues. Uh, there is documentary evidence of the polygamous ceremony that President Woodruff authorized Apostle Anton H. Lund to perform on the Pacific Ocean a month later. And at the meeting in December 1897, where President Woodruff apparently gave final authorization to Lund for the second aboard ship ceremony that Lund would perform. President Woodruff confided the astonishing news about Madame Mountford. Okay, statement from Quinn. Uh, in the last year of his life, Wilford Woodruff thus maintained a public stance that was at variance with his private activities regarding polygamy. Okay, the Utah Independent, March 3rd, 1898. I guess that's a newspaper. A Protestant newspaper, I guess. Uh, when Protestant ministers charged the church with allowing new plural marriages, President Woodruff wrote the editor of the Protestant newspaper uh, that no one had entered into plural marriage by my permission, by Woodruff's permission, since the manifesto was issued. That's a whopper. Okay, four days after that denial was published, President Woodruff held a special meeting with the married children born to his youngest wife and had L. John Nuttall read them the revelation that he had received in 1880, which stated in part, and I say again, woe unto that nation or house or people who seek to hinder my people from obeying the patriarchal law of Abraham. Woe to them. Patriarchal law of Abraham, of course, is polygamy. And he concluded, therefore, let mine apostles keep my commandments and obey my laws, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against you. So he still remembers his 1880 revelation here, but he's saying certain things for, for public consumption, right? Source for this, Prophet uh, Wilfred Woodruff in his diary, March 7, 1898. Uh, pictured above is... Uh, the prophet Abraham. All right, uh, one of Wilford Woodruff's sons that was at this meeting uh, was an apostle. He took this reading of this revelation to heart and married a plural wife three years later. That's one of the sons of Wilford Woodruff. Pictured above Wilford with uh, a couple of his sons, I believe. Uh, source for this is Eliza Avery Clark Woodruff Lambert, autobiography in the LDS, uh, LDS Church Archives. All right, testimony of Walter M. Wolfe in the Reed Smoot case, volume 4, page 11. In August of 1898, a student at Brigham Young Academy in Provo, see picture above, now BYU, uh, a student went with her prospective husband to request President Woodruff's permission to marry polygamously. Woodruff brushed them aside with a wave of his hand and said that he would have nothing to do with the matter, but he referred them to President George Q. Cannon in the First Presidency. Then they were given a letter by President George Q. Cannon to President Ivans of the Juarez Stake, and they went to Mexico where Ivans performed the ceremony. All right, back to a statement from Quinn. Uh, the First Presidency's office not only authorized these post-manifesto plural marriages in Mexico as performed by the presiding authority there, so they were authorized by the First Presidency, but also was aware of and recorded the plural marriages that visiting apostles uh, performed in Mexico. Pictured above, I guess we have some uh, Mormon gentlemen in uh, their jail clothes. Uh, can't really recognize uh, who, in, who any of these guys are. All right, a letter from uh, George Reynolds, pictured above, to Anthony W. Ivins, July 5th, 1898. First Presidency letter book, uh, April to September of 1898. Uh, First Presidency clerk George Reynolds wrote to Anthony W. Ivins, asking for the name of the officiator of four ceilings that occurred in Mexico during March of 1898. Two of these ceilings were polygamous. Uh, he gave the comment, I imagine that it was brother or apostle John W. Taylor who did these marriages. 
and then he re and then he routinely recorded the ordinances in the record book of the then defunct Salt Lake Endowment House. All right, back to Quinn. Uh, until his death in September of 1898, Wilford Woodruff maintained a public image of opposition to a private image of official aloofness from and a personal involvement with post-manifesto polygamy. Lying to the public, but he's personally involved uh, in private. Uh, but he kind of tries to keep it on the down low. Uh, pictured above, uh, looks like Woodruff, uh, Cannon, and uh, Joseph F. Smith uh, as the first presidency there in their top hats. All right, let's move on to Lorenzo Snow, who became the prophet after Wilford Woodruff. Uh, this is from the Minutes of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, January 12th, 1892. Uh, Lorenzo pictured above. In January of 1892, the president of the Twelve, Lorenzo Snow, so he was next in line to become the prophet, uh, Snow said that he did not intend to forsake his wives and had sworn that he would not and that the Lord would not require it. Well, he was wrong about that, right? All right, minutes of the Quorum of the Twelve again. This is April 1st, 1896 be found in the Anthon H. Lund papers, I guess. Uh, so Lorenzo Snow uh, told the quarterly meeting of the apostles in April of 1896 that it was his belief that the Lord would so arrange matters that those brethren who have wives can live with them and raise families by them. Well, that's unlawful cohabitation and that's not what happened, right? All right, same source here, April 1st, 1896. Uh, although in April of that year, Lorenzo Snow had assured the apostles that polygamy will again be practiced by this people, he had misgivings by the time that he had become a church president in September of 1898. So he's basically going to change his mind. All right, another source here, uh, the Journal History, September 15, 1898. Would like to get that. That is a huge set of documents. Um, apparently it was released on DVDs for libraries, but of course I've never been able to get that. Uh, Snow, uh, Snow, who is now the prophet, told a reporter from a New York newspaper, uh, quote, polygamy that is marrying plural wives ceased among the Latter-day Saints on the issuance of President Woodruff's manifesto, October 6, 1890, and his inhibition will not be changed by me. Polygamy ceased, right? <laughs> With the manifesto, so he knows, he knows this is not true. All right, Juarez Stake High Council Minutes, October 29, 1898. Uh, Anthony W. Ivans on October 29, 1898, told the Juarez Stake High Council that during the October conference, uh, President and Apostle George Q. Cannon had, uh, had informed him that President Snow had decided that plural marriages must cease throughout the entire church, and that was absolute and affected Mexico as well as elsewhere. So we'll see if this holds up. Okay, First Presidency, uh, Secretary George F. Gibbs to Bernard Greensfelder, uh, November 8, 1915. Uh, President Snow withdrew all authority from Mexico to solemnize uh, plural marriages there uh, as it had been withdrawn in Utah. All right, uh, but Ivans and Gibbs portrayed this restriction by Lorenzo Snow as more absolute and inclusive than it actually was. Lorenzo Snow stopped plural marriages in Mexico for United States residents who needed First Presidency recommends, but he simultaneously authorized an expansion of post-manifesto polygamy that Wilfred Woodruff never allowed, an expansion. The performance, uh, what was the expansion? It was the performance of plural marriages by the Juarez stake president for stake members who needed no first presidency authorization. And of course, this is uh, from Quinn.
Okay, some letters here uh, from uh, Miles A. Romney to the Apostle John Henry Smith, March 16th, May 14th, July 15th, 1898. Uh, I think Miles Romney is pictured above here. Uh, probably related to Mitt Romney because Mitt Romney, the, uh, the Mormon that ran for president, he has relatives down in, uh, in Mexico, probably in this Juarez stake. Uh, so, since March of 1898, Miles A. Romney of the, of the Juarez Stake High Council had written three letters to Salt Lake City asking for such permission to perform polygamous uh, marriages. Uh, but it was not granted until October of 1898 when Lorenzo Snow was the prophet. Uh, then Anthony W. Ivans began performing plural marriages for Romney and other residents of the stake. All right, the Apostle Matthias F. Cowley in the minutes of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, May 10th, 1911. Uh, before performing a plural marriage in Idaho in October of 1898 for Joseph uh, Morrill, the Apostle Matthias F. Cowley asked permission of President Snow, who simply told me that he would not interfere with Brother Woodruff's and Cannon's work. What does he mean by that? We'll get to that. Pictured above, we have Matthias F. Cowley. All right, uh, comment from Quinn. Uh, it is doubtful that Lorenzo Snow realized that Cowley would continue throughout his presidency to perform these plural marriages within the United States or that George Q. Cannon would continue sending to Cowley any U.S. resident who asked for this privilege. Uh, pictured above, Cowley. Okay, Quinn continues here. Uh, what President Snow had done in October of 1898 was stop plural marriages that required his personal knowledge and consent for specific individuals. What Ivans did in Mexico and Cowley did in the United States no longer required the church president's personal knowledge. So it's like, hear nothing, see nothing, say nothing, I don't know nothing. But your underlings are still doing it, uh, these apostles uh, and uh, Ivans. Uh, pictured above an album by Discharge, <laughs> hardcore punk band uh, that was influ influential in creating thrash metal. All right, uh, what did the prophet Lorenzo Snow tell the public? In the Deseret Evening News, December 29, 1898, he said that polygamous marriages in the Mormon church have entirely ceased. It's a lie. Okay, so about a year uh, after this public statement, we get some information from John Henry Smith. He's an apostle. He's pictured above. This is in his diary, October 13, 1899. Also, Journal History, October 13, 1899. Uh, and August 9, 1900. The prophet Lorenzo Snow instructed uh, Anthony W. Ivans to perform no more plural marriages for residents of the stake in Mexico, an absolute prohibition which Ivan strictly observed throughout the balance of President Snow's presidency. So now are, are we really getting to a manifesto now, right? <laughs> Are they really not going to do any more plural marriages here? Finally, in October of 1899. Okay, journal history, November 3rd, 1899, and November 22nd, 1899. In separate interviews with newspaper correspondents, President Snow denied that polygamous marriages had been performed by the church or with its sanction since he became its president. Lies. And decided as a further concession that polygamists should promise to obey the laws against unlawful cohabitation when brought to trial. Okay, a statement from uh, President Snow in the Desert Evening News again, January 8, 1900. Uh, he says, uh, or he issues a formal statement written for him by the non Mormon judge George W. Barch. Uh, which stated that the church has positively abandoned the practice of polygamy or the solemnization of plural marriages in this and every other state, and no member or officer thereof has any authority whatever 
to perform such plural marriages or enter into such relations. Well, was there any more after this time, January 8th, 1900? Okay, same source here, statement from the prophet Lorenzo Snow. Uh, Nor does the church advise or encourage unlawful cohabitation on the part of any of its members. If, therefore, any member disobeys the law either as to polygamy or unlawful co cohabitation, he must bear his own burden, or in other words, uh, be answerable to the tribunals of the land for, it, for his own action pertaining thereto. So is, is Lorenzo Snow saying he's not living with any of his wives? George Q. Cannon wasn't living with any of these uh, plural wives, and Joseph F. Smith as well, uh, which makes up this first presidency. Okay, statement of the prophet uh, Joseph F. Smith, uh, President and Apostle Anthon H. Lund, and President and Apostle John Henry Smith, April 9, 1911. You can find this in the Messages of the First Presidency, Volume 3, Book uh, in 1911, the First Presidency put this 1900 declaration on an equal footing with the two manifestos sustained by general conferences in 1890 and 1904. So it's kind of like a third manifesto. Okay, but uh, yet again, Lorenzo Snow authorizes another plural marriage. This is the Apostle Abraham Owen Woodruff in his diary, January 2nd, 14 and 17 of 1901. Uh, of course, Abraham Woodruff was the son of the prophet Wilford Woodruff, uh, pictured above uh, Abraham and Wilford together. Uh, the apostle Abraham Owen Woodruff had been courting his prospective plural wife for months. They were courting. And after several private meetings with Lorenzo Snow in January of 1901, uh, he married her. Okay, the Apostle Matthias F. Cowley performed the plural marriage on April 7, 1901 uh, for the Apostle uh, Mariner W. Uh, Merrill. I think Merrill's pictured above. Uh, this according to Quinn. Okay, Quinn uh, gives another statement here. Uh, despite President Snow's firm refusal when Brigham Young Jr. spoke with him, about new polygamy in March, Young married a plural wife the following August. Uh, Brigham Young Jr. pictured above. Uh, he, was an, he was an apostle. Uh, in view of Young's lifelong compliance, even with church presidents with whom he ardently disagreed, it is virtually impossible to see this marriage as an act of deliberate insubordination. So basi basically what he's saying, Lorenzo Snow approved of uh, the Apostle Brigham Young Jr.'s uh, plural wife here uh, in March, what, of 1901? All right, uh, let's go to George Q. Cannon. He's going to approve of a bunch of uh, plural marriages. Remember, he was in the first presidency and, and was an apostle. So some more information from Quinn. Uh, and, of course, Cannon's pictured above. In July of 1892, George Q. Cannon established the system of written recommends which enabled United States residents to go to Mexico for post-manifesto plural marriage ceremonies. All right. On June 22, 1897, Anthony W. Ivans uh, met three U.S. residents in Ciudad Juarez, Mexico, and performed the first of dozens of plural marriages authorized by President and Apostle George Q. Cannon's letters. So Cannon here in the First Presidency auth authorizing dozens of plural marriages uh, around this time frame, 1897. And of course, this is from Quinn. Picture above, we have an old uh, picture of a Mexican town, maybe similar to, to what Juarez uh, looked like at the time. Okay, statement of Matthias F. Cowley in the minutes of the Quorum of the Twelve, May 10th, 1911. Cowley pictured above. Uh, I, the Apostle Matthias F. Cowley, was never instructed to go to a foreign land to perform these polygamous marriages, although in some cases I did so. President George Q. Cannon told me to do these things or I would never have done it. Uh, the most of them went to Brother Cannon and then came to me. And, of course, Callie uh, got excommunicated, kind of as a scapegoat, right? 
Uh, but he's saying, you know, President George Q. Cannon told me to do these things. All right. Uh, President Cannon telling some more lies to the New York uh, Herald, February 5th, 1899. He says, I can assure you on my word, if that is of any value, which it's not, <laughs> that he, President and Apostle George Q. Cannon, replied that there have been no polygamous marriages in Utah since the manifesto. Lies. Uh, have there been any outside of Utah, I asked. I do not know, he replied, and he does know. Okay, Cannon continues here in the same source, the New York Herald. Uh, there probably have been sporadic cases, I guess, of those polygamous marriages outside of Utah. Uh, Cannon said after a pause, uh, but they have not had the sanction of the first presidency. That's not true. All right, same source. Uh, he, uh, Cannon says that a man might go to Canada and marry another wife, he might go to Mexico and have a religious ceremony uniting him to another, Cannon said. So here what he's saying is uh, true. Okay, Quinn continues here. Uh, Until his death on April 12th, 1901, Cannon continued sending prominent church leaders to Cowley, the apostle, uh, for polygamous marriages. And uh, Kelly got excommunicated for it eventually. <laughs> okay, the diary of Joseph H. Dean, September 24, 1890. Uh, following the drafting of the final version of the manifesto, uh, the counselor in the First Presidency, Joseph F. Smith, had dinner with Joseph H. Dean and told him that there is a tacit understanding between the church and the Mexican government that we may practice plural marriage, but must outwardly appear to have but one wife. So the whole public versus private thing. And of course, uh, Joseph F. Smith pictured above. Uh, he's in the first presidency here at this time. All right, we're going to continue with Joseph F. Smith here. Uh, this is in the first presidency office journal, August 20, 1891. Uh, responding to Apostle Heber J. Grant's question in August of 1891, uh, if he regarded the manifesto as a revelation, President Joseph F. Smith answered emphatically, no, not a revelation. Why is it in the scriptures then now? Uh, after explaining that he regarded the document as inspired under the circumstances in which the U.S. government placed the church, Joseph F. Smith added, but he did not believe it to be an emphatic revelation from God abolishing plural marriage. So... Uh, he's kind of explaining it as kind of a political document, right, to get the, the government off their backs. All right, uh, Joseph F. Smith to IED Zundel, December 21st, 1891. Uh, the prophet Joseph F. Smith's conduct was in harmony with these private statements. In August of 1891, his plural wife, Sarah, bore a child. That's after the manifesto. And after 1890, President Smith's wives bore him 11 children in Salt Lake City and two in Idaho. Of course, all these children were post-manifesto babies. Okay, Anthony W. Ivan's marriage record, August 10, 1898. Uh, James Hood Family Group Sheets and John M. Whittaker's Edited Journal, uh, Volume 2, October 1906. Uh, at the end of the summer of 1898, James Hood married a plural wife in Mexico and told his brother that Joseph F. Smith gave him verbal permission for the marriage that Anthony W. Ivins performed on the basis of a recommendation probably signed uh, by President uh, George Q. Cannon. Okay, same source here. Uh, this is a comment from uh, Quinn. Uh, President Joseph F. Smith later denied this and told the brother's bishop, uh, the man is not living or the man is not dead that ever could say that I ever gave my consent for anyone to take a plural wife since the manifesto. And of course, this is a lie. All right, another source here, uh, Anthon H. Lund, Diary, December 30, 1899. Brigham Young Jr., Diary, December 30, 1899. Seymour B. Duncan, Diary, December 30, 1899. Uh, when the prophet Lorenzo Snow proposed an end to all polygamous cohabitation in a temple meeting 
on December 30, 1899, uh, counselor on the first presidency, Joseph F. Smith, objected. Two of his plural wives were then pregnant. Apostle Young recorded that the decision of the meeting was that brethren must not have children born to them by their wives in this state of Utah. Nevertheless, Joseph F. Smith's wives bore him three polygamous children in Salt Lake City after this decision. All right, a statement from Quinn here. Uh, Although his reasons are not presently clear, in 1900, President Joseph F. Smith arranged for new plural marriages to be performed without President Snow's knowledge. So Joseph F. Smith in the first presidency at this time, and and he's also an apostle. Uh, This was in direct opposition uh, to Snow's total prohibition of new plural marriages at the time. All right. Uh, As a result of the cooperation between counselors Cannon and Smith, Apostle Matthias F. Cowley performed the ceremonies for Hugh J. Cannon and John M. Cannon on July 18, 1900. These were the first plural marriages that Cowley had performed in seven months. But now that he had the blessing of the two presidency counselors, Cannon and Smith, Cowley performed several almost every month uh, thereafter. And uh, Quinn continues here. In the month of November 1900, Alexander F. McDonald began performing polygamous marriages for scores of Juarez stake residents who requested that privilege. When McDonald's son-in-law presented the records of these ceremonies to the president and prophet Joseph F. Smith 12 years later, the church president said, Brother Brown, all of this work that Brother McDonald performed was duly authorized by me. So that's a very direct statement there. Duly authorized by the prophet. All right, uh, Quinn continues here. In the next month of September 1901, Uh, Counselor Joseph F. Smith apparently sent word through a visiting apostle to Alexander F. MacDonald not to worry about the prophet Lorenzo Snow's threat of excommunication and to continue performing plural marriages, uh, which he did. So a lot of disagreement here between, uh, you know, the the apostles and the prophets. All right. Uh, After George Q. Cannon's death in April of 1901, Joseph F. Smith, as sole counselor in the First Presidency, was one who sent prominent Mormons to the Apostle Matthias F. Cowley uh, for polygamous ceremonies. This is Quinn. Okay. Upon the prophet Lorenzo Snow's death in October of 1901, his successor, Joseph F. Smith, promoted and protected new polygamous marriages more actively than the two previous church presidents. Okay, another source here, Duncan M. McAllister to Joseph F. Smith, December 19, 1901, and Joseph Christensen Diary, January 5th, 1902. Uh, The prophet Joseph F. Smith at the next testimony meeting in the Salt Lake Temple on January 5th, 1902, uh, preached that a man cannot obtain a fullness only through obedience to the celestial order of marriage or polygamy cannot obtain a fullness without this. Uh, Smith emphasized the fact that it means must, not can or may, etc. Okay, Anthony W. Ivan's marriage record. Uh, The prophet Joseph F. Smith instructed Anthony W. Ivan's to resume performing polygamous marriages for Juarez stake residents the first of which occurred on March 9th, 1902, after the two-and-a-half-year suspension originally imposed upon Ivans uh, by the prophet Lorenzo Snow. So we've got a a lot of uh, disorganization and anarchy basically going on. (laughs) Okay, same source here. Uh, The prophet Joseph F. Smith apparently now felt secure in reestablishing a system of sending U.S. citizens to Mexico for plural marriage ceremonies, and Ivans performed the first such marriage on June 13, 1903 for William A. Morton. All right, uh, Quinn uh, continues here. By the fall of 1903, Joseph F. Smith had decided to expand new polygamous marriages even further uh, in Canada. All right, Quinn continues. Uh, George F. Gibbs, I believe he's the secretary to the first presidency, Uh, also proposed polygamous marriage to a woman in 1903. 
She responded by asking whether the manifesto was just a gesture, and the First Presidency Secretary replied, marvelous that you can see so far. Okay, Heber J. Grant to Lenny Keeler Nagel, October 29, 1934. Uh, Grant pictured above. I have heard uh, that Heber J. Grant had a problem with alcohol. He's uh, maybe an alcoholic. Uh, anyway, Apostle Heber J. Grant later wrote that Apostle Abraham Owen Woodruff performed plural marriages in Mexico in November of 1903 because Woodruff was under the impression that President Joseph F. Smith sanctioned those marriages. Okay, statement from Quinn. Uh, the prophet Joseph F. Smith continued the familiar pattern of denying publicly what was happening privately throughout these years. More significantly, he was keeping his own counselors and half of the apostles in the dark about what he and the other half were doing to promote new polygamous marriages. So <laughs> we got bedlam here. All right, testimony in the Reed Smoot case. Uh, in 1902, when members of the BYU Board of Trustees complained that the institution's president, uh, Benjamin Clough, had actually succeeded in marrying a new plural wife, Joseph F. Smith, who had authorized the ceremony, said that such a thing could not be, this is in public, remember, with the sanction of the church, and that if Clough had done it, he had done something that he had no authority to do. But here, you know, Quinn points out that Joseph F. Smith actually did, actually did authorize this uh, marriage. So, okay, some uh, interesting information in uh, Brigham Young Jr.'s diary, June 5th, 1902. At a meeting on June 5th, 1902, of the First Presidency in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, uh, half of whom had married new plural wives or had performed such marriages for others, the prophet Joseph F. Smith denied that any plural marriages were taking place to his knowledge in the church, either in the U.S. or, or in any other country. It is thoroughly understood and has been for years that no one is authorized to perform any such marriages. This is June 5th, 1902. So we'll see if he contradicts this later. Um, interesting new book out called Like a Fiery Meteor. The Life of Joseph F. Smith by uh, Stephen C. Taysom. He was a pretty volatile guy. I, I believe in this book they talk about him uh, beating his wife. All right, some more information in the Apostle Rudger Clausen's diary, February 19th, 1903. Journal history, November 19th, 1903. Also, President and Apostle Anton H. Lund's diary and Apostle John Henry Smith's diary for uh, the same date, November 19, 1903. Uh, the prophet Joseph F. Smith uh, told the brethren, the First Presidency and the Apostles, pointedly that he had not given his consent to anyone to solemnize plural marriages, not true, that he did not know of any such cases, not true, and if members of our church have entered into such alliances, they have done it upon their own responsibility and without his approval or sanction, and they must therefore abide the consequences. All right, statement from Quinn. Uh, more than any other church president after the 1890 manifesto, Joseph F. Smith divided the church against itself, an apostle against brother apostle, over the question of new polygamous uh, marriages. All right, testimony of Joseph F. Smith in the Reed Smoot hearings. Uh, upon being questioned several times about whether there had been any plural marriages after the 1890 manifesto, the prophet Joseph F. Smith testified, I know of no marriages occurring after the final decision of the Supreme Court of the United States on that question. So he's lying here. All right, same uh, source here, the Reed Smoot hearings. Uh, the sixth prophet of the church continued, uh, Joseph F. Smith, and from that time until today, there has never been, to my knowledge, a plural marriage performed in accordance with the understanding, instruction, connivance, counsel, or permission of the presiding authorities of the church or of the church in any shape or form. Okay, some more testimony of Joseph F. Smith in the Reed Smoot hearings. 
when asked if he, Joseph F. Smith, had performed or knew of any post-manifesto plural marriages, Mr. Smith says, no, sir, I never have. The chairman says, either in Mexico or blah, blah, blah. Mr. Smith says, nowhere on earth, sir. Nowhere on earth, sir. The chairman says, do you know of any such? And Mr. Smith says, no, sir, I do not. Uh, all lies. All right, some more testimony here. Uh, Joseph F. Smith also testified that he had never heard an apostle publicly advocate or defend plural marriage since the manifesto. Uh, not true. Okay, Smith said that none of the current apostles had married plural wives since the manifesto. Not true. Okay, uh, let's get to the second manifesto here. Uh, the second manifesto was announced at the General Conference of the Church held on April 6, 1904. At a public meeting, Joseph F. Smith announced that he would like to read an official statement that he had prepared so that his words may not be misunderstood or misquoted. All right, Prophet Joseph F. Smith, General Conference, April 1904. Uh, Inasmuch as there are numerous reports in circulation that plural marriages have been entered into, contrary to the official declaration of President Woodruff of September 24, 1890, commonly called the Manifesto, which was issued by President Woodruff and adopted by the church at its general conference, October 6, 1890, which forbade any marriages violative of the law of the land. I, Joseph F. Smith, president of the church, hereby affirm and declare that no such marriages have been solemnized with the sanction, consent, or knowledge of the church. Not true. All right, Joseph F. Smith continues here, and I guess this is the second manifesto part here. Uh, and I hereby announce that all such marriages are prohibited, and if any officer or member of the church shall assume to solemnize or enter into any such marriage, he will be deemed in transgression against the church and will be liable uh, to be dealt with according to the rules and regulations thereof and excommunicated therefrom. Okay, Joseph F. Smith's official statement was later published in the Improvement Era, an official magazine of the church. Uh, this is under statement by President Joseph F. Smith, Improvement Era, uh, May 1904, and here's the cover. All right, same general conference here, April 1904. Uh, Francis M. Lyman, president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, then presented the following resolution of endorsement which was seconded by B.H. Roberts and accepted unanimously by those in attendance at the conference. Uh, and here is what it says. Resolve that we, the members of the church and general conference assembled, hereby approve and endorse the statement and declaration of President Joseph F. Smith just made to this conference concerning plural marriages and will support the courts of the church in the enforcement thereof. Okay, more information from uh, Quinn's article. LDS Church Authority and New Plural Marriages, 1890 to 1904, in Dialogue, a Journal of Mormon Thought, which came out in 1985. Uh, yeah, there are, there are later things, of course, on uh, post-manifesto polygamy. Uh, however, I'm not going to go into this. Uh, I think Quinn gives a ton of information in this article, and that's all I'm going to do for this one. Um, at the time of Quinn's article, there were 50,000 or more living descendants of the men who married polygamously with church authority from 1890 through 1904. So that's a lot. 50,000 descendants. All right. Uh, Quinn, again here, being totally honest. This is what I love about Quinn, <laughs> even, though, even though he was a believing member of the church at the time. Uh, we are obliged to recognize that polygamy's practice at times required men that we revere as prophets, seers, and revelators to say and do things that do not strictly conform to our definitions of veracity or truthfulness. They do not conform to our, ide to our ideas of truthfulness and consistency. The resulting situation caused significant segments of the Mormon church to function in cognitive dissonance for prolonged periods of time. We can ignore the past, we can even deny it, 
but we cannot escape its intrusion upon our faithful history. Okay, a couple of uh, final statements by D. Michael Quinn here. And his memoir is about to be published uh, December 18, 2023. It'll be out. His memoir slash diaries, lo looking uh, forward to getting that. Uh, but Quinn here says, history is what we are able to discover of the past. Uh, historical fantasy is what we wish had occurred. And that's what you hear in Sunday school, right? And that's going to do it for this video. We went about two hours, 15 minutes, so not too long for me. Uh, what do you think about all the lying, <laughs> all the disagreements with the general authorities? Uh, but that's going to do it. And I thank you for watching the Post-Manifesto Polygamy 1890-1904 to video.